Hey, 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 Mr. J. Warner Wallace. How are you, brother? Doing good. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. Dude, I'm finally uh, glad that we could have this conversation, man. I've just been I so fascinated by your work, and, and I want to jump right in. Uh, dude, tell me, like, how did you become a cold case detective and, and then go on to eventually write the book and, and kind of piece together how you came to, to know God and all that? Well, I was working um, in the, at the agency, working investigations, and uh, before I was a Christian, and, and after I became a Christian, um, I had young kids, and I was serving at a local church. As you know, even though I was a brand new Christian, they needed the help, and so I would volunteer in the children's ministry. You know, how, how much harm can you do just sitting in the back of the room, right? Somebody else was teaching at first, and then eventually they asked me to teach, and then eventually I decided to go to seminary. You know, several years later. And I became a youth pastor by the time my kids were in high school. And then I became a lead pastor after that. And as I was a youth pastor, we used to prepare our students by taking them on these immersive trips where we would help them learn theology, let's say, by evangelizing with a group that has a different theological uh, underpinning. And it, it, always better if you can go to a group that has a slightly twisted uh, uh, theological framework from Christianity. So like Mormonism is perfect because all the the words that are used by Christians are used by Mormons, but they've redefined everything. So it's helpful to, to take those kinds of immersive trips. Your kids will learn a lot about their own theology as well as the theology of Mormons. So uh, I was taking these trips and we also took a trip every year to UC Berkeley so we could talk about the atheistic worldview or pantheism, other different kinds of worldviews that they would encounter on the campus of UC Berkeley, which here in California is a very liberal, uh, non kind of a, not, not many Christians would, you know, you wouldn't think it was a Christian school, let's put it that way. So uh, while I was doing those trips, I would partner with people, uh, people who have ministries now, uh, uh, Brett Kunkel over at maventruth.com, uh, Sean McDowell, uh, who was Josh McDowell's son. Uh, we would partner and take groups up together and one day, while we were up there, um, I was still working as a detective, but I was taking the weekend to go to this trip with Sean McDowell. I had my daughter in the group, uh, had a bunch of other high schoolers, and I was just teaching them uh, how to defend the historicity of the Bible. And Sean said, hey, you should write a book about that. And I really had no intention of writing a book, uh, primarily because I was overwhelmed with casework. I mean, I was in the middle of, I think, two or three cases that were active at the time in trial. So I said, I don't have time for this. But my wife said, yeah, you should take him up on it. At least write an outline, which I did. And that ended up being Cold Case Christianity, the first book that, for me, kind of launched me in this world of Christian apologetics, which I, was never really something I, I thought of doing. It was not like on my radar for the most part. But here I am. So I uh, just followed the call. <laughs> and that's where we are now is writing books and, and uh, speaking around the country. Now, were you an atheist before you came to know Christ or what was the story? Oh, yeah. There? No, I was very much, uh, you know, I, um, I didn't know a lot of I, I just never saw that as, as like uh, unusual to not believe in God. Growing up where I was growing up in Los Angeles County in the 60s and 70s, I mean, I uh, just the groups I was hanging out with, the kids I hang out with, either never talked about it, uh, or they were openly atheists like me. And so it didn't seem like I was, you know, I wasn't like I was growing up in a part of the country that was highly churched. Now, I'm sure there were great churches all around me, but uh, you know, Los Angeles is a pretty dense city. And we were living in a, a Los Angeles at the time growing up and uh, just didn't meet anybody. And I held that position very, very um, um, firmly, and I was I, I, th I was thoughtful about my atheism. You know, I was the kind of person who had, I could give you five reasons why I didn't think there was a God, um, and why I thought that Christianity, as I saw it really, saw it really primarily through Catholicism, was false. Um, so that's really where I was all, until I was about 35, before we ever went to an evangelical church and heard anyone talk about Jesus as a, you know, in a way that um, grabbed my attention. And so you took kind of the, the tools of being a detective and really then started digging into Christianity. Is that, is that kind of the story? Right. Right. Well, I mean, look, there's, there's these documents. How do we know what we know about 
about Jesus. It's all going to come down to the authority of the sources, the same way that criminal trials come down to the authority of your sources. Uh, clearly, the Gospels are not just a selection. If you've ever read the Gospel of Thomas, it's different in texture than the Gospels we have in the New Testament. And you'll see that it's a collection of wisdom statements from Jesus that are not really connected um, in a timeline, not connected, you know, from the birth of Jesus to the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. The Gospels are different, though. The Gospels aren't just a collection of stories. They actually have a certain chronology. And that it appears that the writers of these Gospels want us to believe that this man lived, this God incarnate, lived in a particular part of history, surrounded by other historical events, as if this actually occurred. This is very much is what we see when we get supplemental reports where people make claims about an event in the past, like my cases, in which they claim that this thing happened over the course of time and that these people interacted in a certain way in the course of history. Maybe it's 1978, you know, when the crime occurred, but, but I can actually test if that document is telling me something true. And that's really why I saw the Gospels as a challenge to test and to see if they contained historically accurate data about Jesus. Wow. So it, growing up as a child, as a young boy, did you have like a, an, a curiosity uh, about things or how did this, you know, this, this desire to be a detective or eventually become a detective, how did that all come about? Well, okay. So I, I, I didn't have a curiosity about religious things or about God, uh, but I was very scientifically curious. You know, I was in that generation that watched us land on the moon as a 10 year old. And, uh, you know, as who uh, you know, grew up with Star Trek, the first generation, the sense that, that uh, we're eventually going to push through every boundary and that science was going to lead the way, pushing through every boundary of mystery about the things that we might have claimed that God did. You know, the same way people who attributed lightning to, to you know, to, to Zeus or whoever, uh, we, would, we would attribute this now to physics. And I thought we were going to eventually push through all of these unknowns. Um, and so that's really where I stood for the longest time. Uh, my dad, though, was a police officer. I was born during his academy, and um, that has a magnetic draw. Even though I, my background's in the arts, it's in uh, design and in architecture. So I got a master's degree in architecture at UCLA. I was working as an architect in Santa Monica when I left to become a police officer. So I kind of felt like it probably, I didn't think I was that well suited for this work and probably didn't feel like I was all that well suited for it really until I got into working cold cases because uh, I, I always uh, knew I could do the work, um, but I didn't think it was part of my shape. Um, but once I got into working cold cases, all those other elements came together. All the arts came together because uh, what we're doing is presenting these cases to juries. And I discovered that if you can make them visual, um, you have a much better chance of, if, if people can feel as though they saw it with their own eyes, uh, they're far more likely to render a verdict. So you had to learn how to speak visually. And so most of my stuff now is, is if you've ever seen my, like my, my, my live uh, presentations, those are visual because that's what I would have to do with the jury. And I try to stay in that lane because that has been really the kind of gift set that I had. So it turns out that God uses all those weird things that you thought were useless and uh, puts them to good use. That's, that's really interesting in, in that, and in even use the language you use to, to make people understand pictures through language, right? Right. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to, uh, what I try to do in a presentation in front of a jury is to basically narrate a Dateline episode or any kind of, you know, a live real, you know, a reality uh, news show that if you think about it, when Dateline is telling the story, they're interviewing people and then they're having B-roll. They're not using PowerPoint, you know, five bullets as to why this is true. No, instead they're showing something as if to bring you along for the ride and you get to watch this crime as it occurs. Sometimes I'll have to reenact certain parts of the investigation. I, I got a, a partner uh, in crime here, the, the district attorney, who I've done most of my cases. I've been on Dateline, I think, more than any other detective in the country. And when we go on these Dateline shows, uh, the, the attorney I work with, John Lewin, he hates that whole B-roll thing, because they'll ask you, well, just go ahead and do it the way you did it before. Like, he doesn't want to do that, okay? His whole thing is, 
But I can see why it's important to narrating the story. Because what are you going to do when Keith Morrison is talking for 10 minutes and narrating the story? You're going to need some visual support. And this is what we're trying to do with um, making a case for anything. Uh, how many times does an object lesson make a case better than anything you might say? Why does Jesus use parables where he tells stories to an agricultural um, uh, culture uh, that, that understands the parables about sowing seeds and about the smallest seed in the garden and all these things that have make sense? Because in their mind, they can develop a word picture. So in, in essence, he is using visual media. He's just doing, using words to get you to think about this visually. This is like that. He's, he's, he's analogizing toward visual um, parables. And I think that's kind of how we're wired. We, we, I think we, we trust first and foremost those things that we can personally process through our empirical senses. So I could read something happen, but if I could see it and hear it and smell it, I have a much better uh, confidence that it really happened, right? because I'm able to assess it. So part of what we're trying to do with this is to at least bring back one element of the senses, your visual senses, so I can see this and okay, now I get it. And, and that's what we're really trying to do is how can I take a difficult concept and make it visual in a way that um, well, everyone will go, okay, I get it. You don't need to say anymore. I can see it now. And that's when and people use that expression all the time. Oh, I can see it or I see because they really need to see it. And so, so a lot of what we're doing is, is trying to make things visual for juries. And that actually is what I've been doing as an apologist, making things visual for, for Christians and non-Christians to at least see how strong the case for Christianity is. You know, the, the power of story is amazing. Yeah. And it, it just, oh. just how people are intrigued by stories. Yeah, oh, that's absolutely. The power of story is one of those things that is, um, well, we all look, we all, we all have a story we can tell. And I, I've talked a lot about this recently that I, I'm not somebody who usually shares my testimony. You've asked for it today. I'm not going to get share, share much of it because to be honest, my testimony is meaningless. It doesn't matter. No one's testimony really matters. We've taken that word testimony and we've changed it from what it was in the New Testament, right? In the New Testament, testimony was reserved for those people in the book of Acts who were eyewitnesses to the resurrection. What they testified whenever asked for a reason for their beliefs, it was not, well, let me tell you how Jesus has changed my life. No, it was, let me tell you what I saw in the resurrected Christ. So I'm not against giving your personal testimony, but trust me, uh, my dad, uh, he, you know, he, he's been married twice to my mom and to his second wife. And in his second wife, he had six, six kids. And so I have six half siblings, all raised Mormon. And they all, Mormons are very consistent about defaulting to their personal testimony as a, may, a way to evangelize. And, and that's because they feel like that personal testimony, God uses that. But if your strategy as a Christian is to do the same thing that Mormons do effectively, you probably have a deficient strategy, right? Because you can do more. We can do better. One thing that Mormons cannot do is make an evidential case for the truth of the Book of Mormon. Because you cannot, you cannot defend the Book of Mormon from archaeology, from any of the evidences you might use to defend the Christian worldview. Because it's not evidentially true. That's, I hate to say that, but that's just what it is. So in the end, I would say, hey, yeah, if you've got a personal testimony, share it. But don't just share that. I mean, at some point, be able to sh share why your personal testimony, why you know that's true, that what happened to you is not a matter of your imagination. It's not the same kind of experience that Hindus have when they share their testimony or that Muslims have when they share their testimony or that Mormons have when they share their testimony. Your testimony, you know, actually, that's not your imagination because it's grounded in something you can demonstrate evidentially. That's what they did in the book of Acts. So I think we have to take the extra step. But that's, that's hard. And most of us are not, we, I think in the end, what I learned as an investigator is that don't get too clever. It, it's not that we are, as, when we do a criminal, uh, commit a crime, it's not that we're, that we're always that clever. Instead, we do the thing that's usually the easiest. Because we are, as humans, innately fallen and lazy rather than ambitious. If I can accomplish the same goal with less moves, I'm probably going to do it with less moves. So I've, I've just learned that if, if this crime could have been committed four or five different ways, but one is the easiest way, let's start there. Because more than likely, the suspect chose the easiest way. Because that's just our nature, right, is to pick the easiest way in. And I think what happens to us as Christians 
is it's really easy to share your personal testimony without ever connecting it evidentially to why you know it's true of the Christian God. Right, right. That's an extra step. And it's not an easy extra step for a lot of people because they've never thought about it. Although, I always say this, most everyone I know, though, can make an evidential case for why Dak Prescott should be paid by the Cowboys. Okay. <laughs> you know, or he shouldn't be paid by the Cowboys or whatever you think it is or why they should not have drafted another quarterback in Green Bay when they could have. There's always something that you are so interested in, if it's not sports, it's something else, that you could actually make a case. You can go back like four years and show how in the last four years they haven't drafted that. And that how do you know all that stuff? Because it was important enough to you to learn it, to learn the players and to be able to make a case for it. Really? Can we not do that for our Christian faith? It seems to me if we can do it for one thing, we ought to be able to do it for the other. And so I think and what I'm hearing you say, and correct me if I'm wrong, so even in our testimonies when we're sharing, it's, it's not about us. It's about pointing them to God and, and making people understand it's about God. Well, right, but it's even more than that because I, my Mormon family will say, yeah, it's not about me. It's about what God did in my life. Now, we're probably going to say, well, okay, but uh, we want to go. We, we have a tendency if somebody else was to come to us from a different theistic worldview, and, and try to persuade us that that worldview is true by using their personal testimony, I'll bet most of you would say it's not sufficient. Don't care. You must have imagined it. Can't be true. Well, why should anybody take our personal testimony unsupported by evidence and feeling differently about it? And that's the problem, right? Is that everyone's got a personal testimony. I, I've actually started to ask this question at churches around the country where I would say, why are you guys Christians? The number one answer, that I get the most popular answer is I was raised as a Christian. My parents were Christians. I was raised in the church. That's the number one most popular answer. The number two most popular answer is I've had some kind of experience that demonstrated for me that Christianity was true. I prayed a prayer. I saw a miracle. I saw something change in my life. There's another third view, which is very similar to the second view. I used to be a jerk and then God changed me. I'm no longer a jerk anymore. Okay. These are all good reasons to be a Christian, but if you ask Mormons, why are you a Mormon? Guess what their top three answers are? Same three. So I, I think we can do better than this. It's not, it's, we can do better than that because it's not just that, yes, it's all God. Yeah, it should point to God. But the reason is, at, at some point, can you think about this? When Jesus selected, it says in Matthew chapter five, when he's on doing the Beatitudes, he's about to do all the blessed are those who who are, you know, uh, merciful, blessed, you know, blessed are, the poor, are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are the gentle. You know the whole, I know the whole, uh, memorize the entire passage. What I think is interesting about the passage is it begins this way. It says, when Jesus saw the crowd, he went up on the mountain. That crowd is a lot. He needed to escape it. After he sat down, his disciples came to him. And then he began to teach his disciples. And he begins by teaching them about the crowd. Blessed are those, 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 those. And at the very end, he says, blessed are you. He turns it toward the disciples. It's very interesting to me to, to see him do that. Who are in that? Who's in that group of disciples? It turns out that Jesus selected disciples who would be his eyewitnesses. So that even when Thomas had doubts and finally sees the risen Christ, he says to Thomas, blessed are you, but blessed are those who have not seen yet we'll discover this truth through you, Thomas. But why? Because Thomas is an eyewitness now. Jesus picks eyewitnesses. That's called direct evidence in criminal trials. There's only two forms of evidence, direct and indirect. Direct evidence is eyewitness testimony. Jesus not only picks eyewitnesses, then when Judas leaves the group, how does Peter replace him? In the upper room in Acts 1, Jesus, or Peter says, we need someone to replace Judas, and he has to be somebody who saw Jesus from the baptism to the resurrection. Why? We're looking for eyewitnesses. The apostles were eyewitnesses of the resurrection. Matthias fit the bill. He's in. Off they go. They continue to, what's, this, what's the Pentecost message from Peter? He's preaching the resurrected Christ, that, that he was a man attested by miracles that you knew. And we saw him rise from the grave. He identified himself as an eyewitness. Paul makes a point of saying, hey, last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. Acts 15, verse 8. Think about that for a second. It was important to Paul to make sure that everyone knew I'm an eyewitness too. 
Why? Because if you're not an eyewitness, your book does not get in the New Testament. If you're not an eyewitness, you're not called an apostle. If you're not an eyewitness, you, 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 didn't, you, you won't find yourself uh, in a position of prominence in that early first century because it was the eyewitnesses that were commissioned. That's a, that's a God who's committed to um, evidence. And this is why, uh, all the time, you know, why does Peter say that Jesus was a man attested to you by miracles? In other words, all the miracles to Jesus were there and used by God to authenticate the messenger. Why listen to Jesus? Because he was authenticated by miracles. Jesus says, if you don't believe what I'm telling you, at least believe on the evidence of these miracles in John. So you see it over and over again, that the evidence actually matters to Jesus. And he uses that evidence, and he asks us to do the same thing. And I think that's the first church, if you look at the church in the first 200 years, filled with case makers. Most of the, um, the most memorable leaders in the church were all also apologists who wrote defenses against the people who did not believe Christianity was true. And we still have those defenses. So I think that that's something we, we are kind of inclined, we, we ought to be inclined to do as Christians. And I, of course, look at it that way anyway, because I'm thinking, okay, if I'm going to look at this seriously, I have to be able to make a case for it, or I'm not going to pay attention to this. And, and that's, that's exactly the approach I took. I love it, man. It's definitely, it's, it's enlightened me to a different way of, of using the word testimony even. Because like you said, I think we all have this tendency to use, well, I've got a testimony. Right. You know? And I think that in the end, uh, even Paul... It's not an either or thing. Don't get me wrong. It's not that we should not use our personal testimony. But when Paul's in front of Festus, in front of Agrippa, he is going to talk about how he saw the risen Christ. And he's also going to talk about his own journey. But he doesn't separate those two things. And, and I think what we kind of think is, hey, that, what God's done with my life is evidence enough. Okay, I get that. But why, why should I trust? Yesterday, the Mormon was at my door. He said the same thing for his view. Do you consider yourself a Mormon? He considers himself a Christian, by the way. <laughs> well, you would say, well, no, I don't consider myself a Mormon. Okay, well, then why should I be wrong? Actually, he got to my house first. He was nicer than you. He came over with a basket. This is what Mormons are some of the nicest people you are ever going to meet. They will out-nice you. So why should I listen to you when he's taking the same approach? I think that's a fair question we have to ask ourselves. Oh, wow. Now, now tell me, in connecting the dots with the story, you became a police officer, then you became a detective. And then how did that then lead into, oh, I'm going to narrow down to cold case. And then how did that lead to Dateline? Well, I was just, I was working investigations as an, an undercover position. Um, and I knew that I, I wanted at some point to um, move over to the desk side of this in the detective, the, our detective division. And uh, I just knew that because I felt like I'd done all the other jobs, and now that was the natural progression of where my career was going to go. I thought I felt like if I came out of the back, if I came out of uh, undercover work and went back to patrol, I was kind of starting to circle back around in some jobs I'd already done. So I, one of the jobs I hadn't done was to take one of the. Uh, I I kind of thought I I love to do interviews, and I was the guy who'd be used a lot for interviews. And I kind of thought, oh, I'll probably get um, opened up at some point. Uh, maybe in sex crimes, because in sex crimes, typically it's a he said, she said, or maybe it's a child involved and where you have to have good interview skills to get the suspect to really open up. So they're really strong interview cases. But the first job that opened up was robbery homicide, and they, they came after me. They said, hey, we want you to come over here robbery homicide. And I was really not interested. <laughs> I was really wanted the interview job because I had been in so many interviews in our, in our, our, our undercover team. And they said, oh, no, you know, um, there's not going to be an opening there for a while, and we really want you over here. So I just, okay, I'll, I'll take the spot. So I worked robbery homicide for five years. And then as I was in robbery homicide, I saw how many unsolved open cases we had in homicides going back like 30 years. And our sergeant was inclined to assign us these cases as collateral duties. So you'd have your, your, your fresh homicides that you're working, and then you'd also have this cold case that you would kind of chip at. But nothing's ever going to happen if that's the case because there's no sense of pressure or urgency on a cold case. It's been unsolved for 30 years. So those cases would just kind of float around and each one of us on the team would have one and nothing much would ever really get done. Uh, but then I got hurt on the job and I had some light duty time. And during that light duty time, I opened up one of the cold cases that had been assigned to our team and I, I solved it. And that's, that's what got the uh, agency interested and excited about um, starting a team 
So I was one of the founding members of the team that started working just cold cases and uh, did that for the rest of my career. Now I'm in Los Angeles County. Um, so, you know, NBC Universal is right up the road and that's where they do all the datelines uh, on the West Coast. So somehow they heard about one of our cases and I don't know why they were even interested in it, but they were. And that started a long relationship of about maybe eight years. Uh, so we just did, you know, every time we did a case, Dateline at first, they, they just did the cases we'd already finished. But then they wanted to kind of get involved before we even went to trial because they love to be in trial with you. So I did several where I'm actually had uh, had Dateline in the in the uh, room with me. So was there can is there one or two that you can share that were just some of the more fascinating cases that you solved? Yeah, I've, I've kind of archived them a little bit at our website at coldcasechristianity.com. Just type in Dateline cases in the uh, search bar there. And you'll, you'll see all of them will pop up. But, um, you know, the, I, all these cases, I feel like they're almost routine to me now because I've talked about them so much. But, but yeah, I mean, the, the older cases are always the most satisfying because you're, you're racing against time because you're, you try to pick the older ones first because you're worried that your witnesses uh, are already dying and, and then you might have even fewer <laughs> going forward. So you're just trying to figure out, you know, what can, what can we do before everyone's gone? Uh, or before it's just, also we're looking at the cases that maybe have, you know, I, I, we went through the entire set when I first started looking to see if there were any DNA cases because, you know, this is a technology was not available to us back then. And uh, unfortunately, I just didn't have any uh, in that set of maybe 30 we first opened. I, I couldn't find anything that I thought would be a quick, a quick solve. The one I did think would be a quick solve, I, I did pull DNA on that one and, and got it started about around 2003, and we just solved that through familial DNA, ancestry DNA, last year. So what's that? That's 19. That's that's 16 years from the point of opening it to the point of clearing it, just because of luck of the draw. I mean, some people solve a bunch of cases with DNA. I just didn't happen to have any of those, so we had to do a different, take a different approach. And so a lot of that is about thinking about, well, okay, let's see how strong the cases were to begin with. And then let's see what, what, boy, what, what could you dream would be the best piece of evidence you could add to this? Is there a way to get that piece of evidence by being creative? Is there something that is, is, was, was not seen that was kind of hiding in plain sight, that old expression we always talk about? Are, were there words that were said that, that people just didn't hear? So you're learning how to listen better, you know, how to listen to the interviews better, how to what, read the interviews. We have all the interviews transcribed, how to use forensic statement analysis, going through the interviews to see, well, look, why did he use that word? Why did he not use this word? And just try to get some insight from the interview. That's almost one of the first things I would do on any cold case would be to, to look at the interviews and have them transcribed so I could really pick apart his word choices, you know, the suspects. So sometimes they'd be interviewed 30 years ago. They were a suspect back then, but nothing ever happened. But I still have the interview. So I can look back and say, okay, you know, and, and then hopefully we'll start to stage a new set of interviews to get even further data that we can add to the case. So a lot of that though, in the end, you got to make it visual in front of the jury. You got to show how those puzzle pieces go together. Because um, I don't know if people don't realize that, that all of our cases in America, most cases that go to trial, the vast majority of cases are entirely circumstantial. And what I mean is there's direct evidence eyewitness testimony, there's indirect evidence, that's everything else, DNA, that's indirect evidence. Indirect evidence is also called circumstantial. So it turns out if you've got eyewitnesses who saw you do the crime, more than likely you're taking a plea deal before you ever go to trial because this is a slam dunk case. The cases that go to trial are the cases where the suspect thinks they got no witnesses, we can beat this. So we have to go to trial with the circumstantial cases and that's why we're in trial with so many circumstantial cases. But it turns out if you can make it visual and they can see how much evidence points to the same guy, it's death by a thousand paper cuts. Now, suddenly that stuff didn't seem like it was all that big of a deal, but we got a lot of pieces of evidence pointing to the same conclusion. It seems overwhelming. So how do you make the, 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 the truly overwhelming nature of a case appear to be truly overwhelming to a jury? And a lot of that is done visually. <laughs> you know, one of the things too, I've always been fascinated by, I wish I would have went back and learned is the whole body language thing. Is that something that yeah. you do too, even in these older oh, interviews? Yeah, sometimes, you know, I think we ha you have to do a lot of interviews before you start to catch it in real time. So what happens is the first, you, you might go to a, a class 
you start off in interview school and you have some intuitive sense of how people behave and when they see certain body and they're like you know when they're locking up on you and you real you know or when they're you know they're they're always uh kind of guarding them yeah you see certain things and you kind of have an intuitive sense about what that might mean but then you go to classes and you learn a little more but even then it's hard it takes a lot of interviews before you start to see it in real time that's why we often will, will record these interviews and have our partners who've also been trained in this way in the next room watching the interview because they're not trying to process what he just said and i'm thinking about well i'm gonna, I'm gonna do this i'm gonna come over here and ask it this way i'm trying to think about those things and as i'm thinking about those things of course i'm missing stuff that it takes a lot of interviews for you to be able to sit back and just catch the whole room in your first first interviews you're, you're spending more time thinking about where you want to go with the interview and how to respond or thinking about his word choices but i'm maybe missing missing some gestures well, your partners aren't missing those gestures because they're not thinking about the things that you're thinking about. They're just watching. They're like watching him and they're not thinking about, they don't care what I'm going to ask. They're watching his responses. And so I'll take breaks and go out and, you know, I'm going to get a drink of water. I'll be right back. Do you want some water? Yeah, sure. Okay, great. I'll get some water. So I go out and I'm talking to my partners. Hey, what am I missing? What did you see? And as a team, we're interacting and saying, yeah, did you notice when you said this, he did that? I would go back and ask that question again. And so what you're looking for are ways to, to maximize. But yeah, that gesture stuff is important. You know, it's not like there used to be a show on Fox that was like a show about uh, micro gestures, you know, and, and, and word choice. And I, I've never really met anybody, you know, who could do it like that, you know, of course. And, and also this is a, an, an art more than it's a science. So the fact that I might present a gesture just means it's something I need to write down. I need to, 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 to go back to that question again. But I don't know this guy well enough to know what those kinds of gestures mean to him. For all I know, he always uses those words in that way. And he always gestures like that. I'd have to spend a day with the guy or two days with the guy before I could even know if it's important. So that's the art side of it. It's like, it's not like, oh, if he does this, if this happens over here, it means X. Not necessarily. <laughs> it might mean X for him, but it might not mean X for him. You'd have to know him a lot better. So a lot of it is just not so much that I'm going to go into court and say, did you see that little twitch over there? Here's what that means. Like, not going to, that's never going to ever get into a, a jury trial. That's interpretive. But here's what it does tell me in real time. If I see him do that, oh, I'm going to ask that question a different way. And then his responses might be different. And that stuff will go to trial. So although I can never talk about how the micro gesture got me to ask that question that got that response from him, that response from him does enter into that record. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get the responses. Dude, this is, <laughs> this is so, yeah, it's so fascinating for me. That's, this is, I always wish I could go back and be a detective or something or undercover agent or PI or something. Well, cause I also, love there are people who are a lot better at doing those things. So everyone's got a set of gifts. And so uh, I know that I, I have certain strengths in certain areas and my partners are stronger in certain areas. And that's why as a team, it's kind of like the church, right? We know that, that some of us are our are, are feet and some of us are hands and, and together we're going to get this done. Um, so I think that's part of it is surrounding yourself with good team members, hopefully who are equally trained and done as many interviews as you have. And you can't be too prideful to take advice from your, your team. Amen. Um, Amen. It's that servant leadership, right? You got to. Right. Or just knowing that's why, you know, a lot of times, you know, I'm in a paramilitary organization. That means that typically the guy who is senior to you, lords over you okay he's making more money than you he's going to retire before you do he's going to pick his days off before you pick your days off because he's senior he's going to pick his vacations before you pick your vacations because he's senior and when we get to that crime scene more than likely he's going to call the shots because he's senior to you so um sometimes that guy's the best investigator in the room sometimes though he's not and then you have to kind of figure out how do I work with somebody who I think we should go a different direction, but he is senior and he's saying we should do it this way. So, so that is one of the challenges you're going to have in this kind of a job is that it is a paramilitary organization and the seniority still matters. Now tell me in, in your investigation of Christianity, was, was there one moment or was it just a collection of things in the moment that you was like, wow, this is the real deal. I mean, give me that story of, like when your eyes really opened to the to the idea of the gospel and that it was true. Well, it was it was a period of time, and so it wasn't. It isn't one. It's never one thing for me, even on these criminal cases. I've had cases where partners were so sure early on. Oh, I'm I'm convinced. Now I get it. 
ultimately I'm going to be convinced too. I, I really haven't had a situation where a partner who was convinced early was wrong. Um, but I'm just the last guy in because I've been burned. You know, I have thought that somebody was the guy based on any small collection of pieces only to find out the more I collected that I was wrong. Um, so I just, I'm now very, very, I want to be the last guy in. And that was probably in place for me before I really started looking at Christianity too. So uh, it, I'm going to be, and this is a big ask. This was kind of a life changing move if I'm going to believe this is true. Um, and so it was, it took a long period of time for me to really, and I can remember uh, I was part of a large church that was really not the kind of church that would uh, necessarily talk about this from the pulpit, uh, the evidence for, make a case for from the pulpit. But the church was so large that they would at least have like a small ministry if you were interested in taking next steps to learn more about Christianity. Now, when I got into that, that class to learn more about Christianity, um, my questions were not about, I want to know what's the doctrine of, of the deity of Christ or the triune nature of God. I didn't care about your doctrines. I needed to know, why do you trust this Bible? And I had all my, my doubts were about the manuscript evidence. Do we have any reason to believe that this, any of this is true? And primarily, I had my doubts because I had Mormon family, six brothers and sisters, who were absolutely sure the Book of Mormon was true. So I just needed to know, you know, why should I trust this? So I would push those teachers. Now, lucky for me, in that little class, the, the, those guys actually had answers. And they could begin to kind of help. Now, they weren't like the most robust answers, you, but at least they could start me in a direction where I could say, okay, I need to, to probably buy some church fathers. I need to look at some of the ancient, more ancient manuscripts. Like, what's the transmission of this document? You know, what is the history of the canonization of the, of the New Testament? I need to do some homework in history to see if I had any good reason to believe this was true. And because I already saw some stuff within the text, that forensic statement analysis we were talking about, I already could see some stuff in the text that I thought was compelling. It was like, ah, oh, that that seems to that's about what I would expect from eyewitness accounts. There's, a, for example, if you've ever noticed, the gospels are not presented in the exactly the same order. The order of events in Luke is different than the order of events in Mark. Not only that, there are details that seem to be missing. And if you just compare verses, the verse count, I was just doing this the other day, I'm writing another, my, my eighth book on this topic. And it's clear, it's very clear that there are um, st there's stuff missing. So for example, you've got uh, 10, 1,071 verses in Matthew, but you've only got 678 verses in Mark. Mark is far less detailed. There's a bunch of stuff missing from Mark that's in Matthew. 1151 verses in Luke, the most the most robust gospel, but there's only 879 in, in John. A ton of stuff is missing from John that's in all the other three gospels. And John even tells us, hey, a lot of stuff happened that is not recorded in this book. And if we did record it, there'd probably be more books than we could fill up shelves, right? I mean, there's even more books than, you can, than all the books in the world. So it's clear there's stuff missing from each gospel. The question then becomes, well, why is that missing? This is also true of every set of, 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 of eyewitnesses you'll have for any criminal event. If I was to write down the number of words that witness A, B, C, and D give me, they'll be different numbers. Some will leave stuff out. They'll not leave out the exact stuff. <laughs> Each person leaves out a different set of things. Well, why is that happening? You were all standing there. This only happened three hours ago. How can just three hours go by? Yet you give me, I'm just letting you go. Tell me what happened from the moment you walked in to the moment you walked out. I'll let them talk. Yet each person, when I let them talk without interruption, gives me different lengths of observations, and some, and they're each one missing different things. Well, you just come to see that and recognize that's just the nature of how we, as eyewitnesses, and how we, as chroniclers, of anything that happened, even today. If you were to talk to your wife tomorrow about what you did today, you're going to leave out a bunch of stuff, and I might ask, why did you include this? Why did you include that? And that's what we see in eyewitness accounts. And so as I looked at the Gospels, I was like, okay, there's some comfort level I have. I would be very uncomfortable if they said the exact same thing. As a matter of fact, I thought the more I saw what appeared to be contradictions, but there is, you can resolve these. But at least at first, when you read them, you go, oh, that doesn't seem like it matches. That gave me great confidence that I had a place to start because that's the case with every single eyewitness account you're ever going to read. If you, and by the way, defense attorneys know this. They love this. They will try to leverage this in the trial. 
these accounts don't match. So you can't trust these eyewitnesses. And we have to help jurors understand the nature of eyewitness testimony. And I already knew that. So as I was reading through the Gospels, I felt really comfortable that uh, I had a place to start. That's a matter of fact, that's the thing that got me interested. Is as I'm reading through the Gospels, I'm going, wow, you know, the way this person says it differently, and he's consistent about, for example, Mark is an action guy. It's very, you know, and very abrupt. Like, not a lot of detail. Just the facts, man. You know, that's, that's kind of Mark. Well, the fact that he's consistent that way, that's interesting to me. That really tells me something about the author. Now, you might say, well, Mark, you don't even know who Mark is. And I don't believe Mark is the author of that. Well, to me, I'm like, if, if you're going to fake a name, you would call it Peter. You would call it, you know, Andrew. You would call it somebody who's in the set of disciples. You're going to call it, give it a name like Mark. Who the heck is Mark? He wasn't there. He didn't see this stuff. Well, Mark actually is the protege we see in the book of Acts who sat at Peter's feet in Rome and wrote the gospel of Mark from Peter's teaching. This is according to Papias, who was a first century, early second century bishop. So my point is, if you're going to fake a name, then it seems to me I would have four, the top four, I'd be James, John, Matthew, and Andrew. Why would you bring Luke into this? He's not an eyewitness, and he tells you that. He's only an eyewitness in the book of Acts. He has to ask everybody what happened to chronicle the gospel of Luke. If you're thinking you're faking Luke's name, wouldn't you fake a better name? Wouldn't you fake a better name than Mark? So I just never saw that as persuasive. And the early history of the church explains who the authors are, and it gives you some insight into, remember, a gospel doesn't even appear until after the first disciples are martyred, which I think is really interesting. There's a sense, I think, that they all thought they were going to get out of this alive, and they would not have to write anything. They could just verbally tell it until Jesus comes back. It's only when people start dying that they start to write this stuff down. So I feel like that's something that is also uh, reasonable. And I also know from working cold cases that you might think that a person who hasn't seen something in 30 years, it's been 30 years since they did see it, uh, really cannot accurately recall it. But it depends on what kind of memory it is, because not all memories are created equal. And so some memories are so uh, pronounced in your mind that you remember them. You know, I, I, I can't tell you what I do with my wife on every Valentine's Day, going back 41 Valentine's Days, but I can tell you what I did in 1988, because that was the day I married her. So that Valentine's Day is different than the rest. And if you are out fishing one day and a dude walks up to you on the water, I don't care how many days of fishing you've had, you're going to remember that day because that's a different day. <laughs> yes, and I'll tell you, you what happens in homicides is in homicides, where they'll, they'll get challenged on the, on the stand. Um, and the defense attorney will say, how can you be so sure? How many years ago was that? Yes. And they'll tell you, oh, 33 years ago. Oh, really? And you don't remember the, the day the day. Uh, what happened earlier in the day? Well, no, I don't. So why should I believe you about this? And we'll have to come up and re-examine, you know, redirect, and, and we'll ask another question. Um, witness so-and-so. How many murders have you seen? One. Did it, did it traumatize you a little bit? <laughs> yeah. Do you think you ever, ever forget the details of that one murder you've seen? No. Your witness. Because the reality of it is, is that those are traumatic, once-in-a-lifetime events that mean something. Those stick in your head. And what we have in the Gospels are a series of miraculous events that stuck in the heads of these people who spoke them repeatedly for decades and then wrote them. And, and so, I, again, you can, if you've got, well, I'm not quite sure they're 100% what, okay, well, look, as an investigator, I was not concerned about inerrancy. As a Christian, I get it. I, I hold to inerrancy. But as an investigator, I just needed it to be reliable. No witness is inerrant. But a witness can be reliable, yet not be inerrant. So from as an early investigator of the Gospels, I was not interested in inerrancy. I was interested only in reliability. Now, I can tell you, having done this and pieced these all together, I, I believe that the original autographs of the New Testament documents are the inerrant word of God. But we don't have any of those. Those were lost centuries ago. We just have copies of the autographs, and I believe we can take those copies and return reliably to the inerrant original. And that's what we're doing when we do this kind of manuscript uh, work. Brother, that is, I could listen to you for hours, man. It's, it's just 
fascinating stuff. We didn't really get into any of the father stuff. <laughs> so, well, I know, right? No, yeah. no, no. So to wind up though, I, I think this is a good question with, because I know this is something every, most men deal with. And I can see this in your profession to where you get so wrapped up in a case, it's hard to disconnect from it when you go yeah. home for your family. Yeah. Is yeah. that something, I, I think most men, you know, taking your work home, that's an issue, right? Is that something you've struggled with and, and how have you kind of overcome that? Yeah, I'm trying to figure out why that was not as, as difficult for me as it might be for others, because I think you're right. I think it is something that we all as men struggle with. Um, I'll tell you a couple of things I, I, early on. If you want to, to be the best parent, and the best, yeah, the best parent you can be as a dad, and I knew this before I even became a Christian, then you need to spend your energy on one thing. You need to be the best husband you can be to your wife. Because in the end, it's that relationship, from that relationship, that all that other stuff flows. And um, if you think you can divorce those two things, if you can disconnect your, your relationship with your spouse from the, the content, the, from the way in which you parent your kids, the kids who do the best emotionally, and we've done studies on this for years, statistically, in terms of income, future income, uh, lower incarceration, lower rates of teenage pregnancy, lower rates of drug abuse, higher educational goals and achievement, higher employment goals and achievement. Those kids come, you ready? It's pretty controversial, from two biological parents in a low conflict setting. It's that simple. Two biological parents in a low conflict setting. I was not raised that way. My parents divorced when I was three. My mom never remarried. I was raised by one biological parent in a low conflict setting. It's not great, but it's okay. I mean, as you can turn out fine, it would have been far better if I had been raised by two biological parents who were in a low conflict setting, but it wasn't the case for me. I, in my own family, I don't, I don't have a family that is, is structured this way because I have two biological children and two adopted children. Now, for my adopted kids, they are being raised by two parents in a low conflict uh, setting, but they're not biological parents. It'd be better for them if they had their own biological parents in a low conflict setting, but that was not available to them. So in the end, it turns out that those two biological parents in the low conflict setting is the magic, you know, the secret sauce that makes everything else work. So if you thought, well, I want to improve my parenting, improve your, your spousing, and that'll help you improve your parenting. So I, I for me, I'm only, I mean, I, I look, in the end, I have, like everybody else, I have, um, you know, disappointments related to my job. But when it comes to parenting and being a spouse, you probably have what are called regrets. And I would far rather have disappointments than regrets. So I just decided that this is going to be the thing that is, I, I love marriage more than I love my wife. And from that, everything else has been, you know, look, I want the kind of marriage that is a, a, the best marriage I could possibly have. So that means that my wife's going to be the recipient of that, I hope. But it's because I, there's this third thing. There's me and there's Susie. And there's this third thing called marriage that I actually love more than, than either one of us. Then on those days when you're struggling and feeling like, hey, I don't, you know, I I'm just feel like letting all the stuff I brought home from work today just spill it all out on my marriage. Well, no, I actually love my marriage. I got to protect that. Um, so, and I love that more than my job. I'm, I'm already retired. I'm not retired from my marriage. My kids are gone. They moved out. <laughs> they got their own lives now. Uh, my marriage is, I, I'm still uh, married. The, the thing that I wanted to invest in, hopefully I've invested in it enough, that, that, that's still available to me, you know, 41 years in. And I think for a lot of us, that, 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 making that your priority means that you're more likely to stop that thing you're about to say. Now, I had a job that was crazy and distressful, and it stressed me out quite a bit. And I didn't think it was my shape, really. You know, a lot of what I was, I was more artistic, more creative. Then I found creative ways to work cold cases. So once I got into cold cases, I was in my sweet spot. But for a lot of years, I wasn't doing that. When I was working gangs, I worked SWAT for three years. Those were stressful years. And um, I think what helped me not bring it home was knowing that I, and I occasionally, of course, we all do, but I knew that the thing I had to protect was not my job. You are not called to love your job or to love your ministry or to love your podcasts or your blogs or any of the things you're doing the way that Christ loves the church. You're called to love your spouse the way that Christ loves the church. So what typically happens is we end up loving all the other stuff more. 
because, you know, there's a season when you're both distracted, right? That season of parenting is when, you know, your wife's probably distracted and investing thousands upon thousands of hours into parenting that you probably are investing in your career. And, and when we do that, it's like, I feel like, I, um, you know, I, I was, I was um, kind of removed from my wife for a number of years. I, we, you know, we were separated for a number of years in this job. So we would live together, but we weren't always alone. You know, we always had our kids around us. You, and so if you're in that season right now of parenting, how you make sure you don't bring the job home is you cherish your marriage more than your stupid job. Because that thing in the end is not going to honor you. You know, if you think about a dartboard, right, or a bullseye on a target, the 10 ring is in the center, and then you have all the way out to the one ring. We spend a lot of time trying to impress the people that are in our one ring when the people who know us best are the people who are right in the bullseye with us. And we spend a lot of time trying to impress the ones when our tens actually know exactly who we are. And the, all the people at your work, believe it or not, they're in the ones and twos. They're never really going to know you the way that your family and your wife knows you. That person's in the ten ring with you. So a lot of this was just about my saying, okay, I got to get, got to get right about who is, who really matters. And then hopefully out of that, your kids will see you love your wife that way. And, and again, it just so happens that two biological parents in a low conflict setting have a, now for a lot of us, that's not your, if you're already remarried and you've already, that, that doesn't, okay, I get it. I'm not raising my kids that way. And I wasn't raised that way either, but I know that that is, there's a reason why that is God's plan for marriage because it turns out it does produce the most, even the amount of abuse that kids take is far greater in blended families than it is in bi biological parents for the most part, don't mess with their kids the way that non-biological parents do. So I think uh, for a lot of it is about cherishing the marriage. And, and I, for me personally, uh, because my own parents were not able to stay together, it became the first priority for me growing up is that I was not going to let that happen to my family. Dude, so, that's a by good way, word. If you think you hadn't had that in your family, well, guess what? You get the chance to be the first generation to fix that. And then I just wanted my kids to know that that their parents did it, and then my grandkids to know that their grandparents did it, and then you hopefully, by that time, they don't know what their great-grandparents great did, <laughs> so, <laughs> so you've already corrected it. So that's my hope. Amen, dude. I love it, man. Tell people how they can connect with you, how they can look at the books, everything as far as website and all that's concerned. So everything is at coldcasechristianity.com, and we have a kids' children's academy where we teach apologetics to kids. It's at Case Makers Academy for 8 to 12-year-olds, casemakersacademy.com. I love it, man. And you, you said you're working. So name off a few of the books because I know obviously yeah, Cold so Case I, Christianity I, is a big one. Yeah, Cold Case Christianity and God's Crime Scene is the case for God's existence from the evidence in the universe. And Forensic Faith is the case for why you ought to make the case in the first place. That's called Forensic Faith. We also have a a uh, book that I wrote with Sean McDowell, just talking about young people, Gen Z, high schoolers, and how to train high schoolers. It's called So the Next Generation Will Know. That published about a year ago, and that'll help you kind of uh, some, some, some real specific strategies for how to teach Christian worldview to your own family. Love it. Love it. Love it. Man, we can all use some help there for sure. Thanks, brother. I appreciate you. Hey, dude, greatly appreciate you. And we're going to, I'm going to have to have you back on because yeah. there's, <laughs> there's, sure. I'm going to have to watch this over and over again to unpack because there's so much good stuff here, bro. I greatly appreciate you taking the time to do this, dude. Yeah, glad to do it. Really glad to be with you. Thank you. We'll talk to you soon. Right, okay, talk bye. to you later.